No. I'm not worried at all. I rely on God, Allah. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Welcome to a special edition of the Life Hack podcast. Today we have a friend of the show, the uh, not only a friend but a you could say resident sheikh for the Life Hack podcast, and that's Sheikh Abdul Rahman Murad. We are pleased to welcome you, Sheikh, to the podcast once again. Welcome, Allah. Jazakallah khair. It's good to be here. It's good to have you. This was Subhanallah. A blessing to have you with us because uh, we are in the same city together, able to do the podcast in person. Uh, whereas uh, because you reside in another city, we would have to do it yeah. uh, online. So I think the chemistry, the dynamic is always more special. And I think it's better for the viewers as well oh, when yeah. you're here in person. So in, alhamdulillah. Look, in person always. I prefer that a thousand times over yeah. the online. But alhamdulillah, Allah malak alhamd. Nonetheless, it's good to be here. Barakallah feekum, Shaykh. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the efforts and da'wah that you and the team are doing. Alhamdulillah. Jazawma khair. Uh, it's, uh, again, the pleasure is all ours. And, one, you know, jazawma khair once again for taking the time out of your uh, busy schedule with uh, family commitments, the masjid, the center, everything that's going mm-hmm. on uh, to be able to be here um, with us, okay. inshallah ta'ala. Now, Sheikh, uh, I want to start off with something um, that is a little bit controversial. Okay. Uh, there was a clip that was posted on our channel, on our platform, that's garnered a lot of attention, both positive and both negative. Now, uh, we've spoken about this clip in private, uh, about uh, in an academic manner. So mm-hmm. not in a manner that's oftentimes discussed maybe online, which is sometimes um, devoid of the proper etiquettes of how sometimes these mm-hmm. topics should be uh, approached. But we've sp- spoken about it in, in, in private, more in an academic uh, type of lens. And uh, before I ask you this question, we can set the context that in general, uh, Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, uh, the scholars of our past, and even the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Many times, you have their contemporaries, their students, write descriptions of how they looked, or they yeah. we have records of their genealogy, their family mm-hmm. tree, and, and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Their their race, their ethnicity, mm-hmm. uh, their their color, how they even appeared. So we mm-hmm. have uh, many uh, examples of this, right? Yeah. Now. The clip that I'm in, uh, that I'm referencing, is in regards to uh, a claim that Umar bin al-Khattab radiAllahu an was black in complexion, or that he may have had a, like African ancestry. Mm-hmm. Okay, now uh, can we uh, reliably make that conclusion? Can we reliably, academically, mm-hmm. make that conclusion? that Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu an was of black complexion and or that you know he had this uh, mm-hmm. African yeah. an- ancestry. And if, if if not or if so, what is a more accurate narration and, and whatnot? And just uh, you know to be clear, uh, maybe we can, uh, if you can comment of whatever uh, academically result that we arrive at, that this is not indicative Mm -hmm. of the superiority of that ethnicity Mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean? It's not like it's, is it, or can we? Can we say because the Sahaba were mostly uh, black or not black, that that in and of its essence is praiseworthy, Mm -hmm. you know, the the, the color or the race or the ethnicity. So if you can comment on those uh, particular uh, points. Yeah, so there's a few things over here we want to unpackage. First and foremost, in terms of, you know, how one is favored in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. So definitely when it comes to one being favored by Allah Azza wa Jal, it's not on account of your skin color, uh, who your parents are, what ethnicity you come from, what languages you can speak, none of that. Mm. It is based upon one's, you know, something that is unknown to all of us, and that is their personal relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at taqwa in specific. Mm. So on account of a taqwa, one will be closer to Allah Azza wa Jal or distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One will be become more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal or uh, the opposite. It's all on account of a taqwa. That is the base. Mm. Um, now, so Islamically yeah. speaking, you see, especially in the West, a lot of rhetoric around um, you know people's 
ethnicities or the race or or whatever like yeah. you know in relation to that let's keep it in related to in relation to that so you have people say okay i'm proud because i'm black i'm proud because i'm white i'm proud because maybe i'm this ethnicity i'm pakistani i'm mm-hmm. arab i'm lebanese yeah. i'm somali you know what i mean so like is that something that we should show pride in like your yeah. ethnicity or your color well we have a clear uh, mm. uh, text in this, and this uh, is the words of the Prophet Sallallahu mm. Alaihi Wasallam where he said فَإِنَّهَا This is a reference, basically leave it aside, it is rotten. This was you know, said in light of what took place during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time where two companions, they got into a fight, an argument, one being from the Ansar, one being from the Muhajirun, and they called out, oh those Ansar come to my aid, come, oh Muhajirun come to my aid. So that almost caused a division among the companions. Therefore the Prophet وسلم, addressed this immediately, sent, telling them, فَإِنَّهَا مُنْتِنَا You know, we have a bond that goes above and beyond every dunya-based bond, which is the bond of our aqidah. Regardless of where you're from, I am a brother to you, as long as you hold to La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. So in that regard, we are brothers. We don't look at anything else. And the the example of this brotherhood, we can see clearly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's time. When Bilal radiallahu anhu was chosen to become Mu'addin, why was he chosen? Was it because of his skin color? Or his ethnicity? His background? No. It's because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, you know, uh, his voice is stronger than your voice. So it's based on something that, you know, that would be needed at that time. There's no microphones back then. So you look at the person who can do the job best, and therefore, he was given that duty. There was another companion who could have, and he saw the dream. Now, initially, the, the whole story of the Adhan, um, when the companions were debating among themselves how they could go about calling people to the Salah. Some said use the bell, some said use a horn. And then, you know, they basically slept on that. And one of the companions, he saw a dream wherein he was given the adhan. He went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam concurred that this is something, you know, that is, uh, we can take it. This is, you know, he concurred that dream. Essentially, it became a sunnah practice thereafter. He didn't tell that companions because you saw it, you can go ahead and make the adhan. He said, go to Bilal, teach this adhan to Bilal because Bilal radiallahu anh, he has a stronger, more powerful voice than you. So he has given this not on account or by the virtue of his background, the masa'ib and trials that he went through, it was given to him on account of something very specific. Mm. So the best man for the job at that time, that's how we view it. Um, and that's how it was during Rasulullah's time overall. Uh, no one was chosen or given preference based on a cultural ground or ethnic ground. That was never the case. If that was the case, you would have seen, for example, uh, the Khulafa al-Rashidun. They would have been from the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa For example, that would have been the case. That was not the case. The best person after Rasulullah was Abu Bakr radiallahu anh. He was chosen not because of his ethnicity or his background or that he's from Quraysh. No, it's because of his, you know, piety, his taqwa, his closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal, that he was chosen in this position after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So so on and so forth with Umar radiallahu an, with Uthman, with Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Now, uh, that in mind, I think we go back to what you mentioned initially about Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an being from a certain, you know, uh, uh, ethnic background or even let's say having a certain ethnic link or, you know, um, having a certain color tone, a skin uh, you know, a tone that's different from what might be common at that time. Now, before we even go into this and look at the proofs for this, we have to ask ourselves, does it, would it make a difference if Umar radiallahu an was you know, darker in skin tone or lighter in skin tone? I mean, would that make any difference before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Of course not. It's not based on that, you know, uh, issue that he was given whatever he was given the positions uh, or given that father in favor in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's an account of his iman and his taqwa well why do people make it an issue then why do you think people are emphasizing that as an issue that yeah. needs to be discussed well i think to a great extent this day and age there's been a lot of oppression uh, people are oppressed based on the ignorance that we see overall uh, even in certain muslim communities you'll find the same thing where people begin to uh, distinguish between skin tones and they would prefer a certain skin color and they would make fun of people from different ethnicities. The ignorance that we see from the pre-Islamic era has now become manifest in this day and age. Because of that, we have, subhanAllah, um, in a widespread 
ignorance. We also have, subhanAllah, the problems that we face today. In light of this, you're going to find, you know, when there's a reaction of this sort, you're going to have a polar opposite reaction as well, where people now, uh, they'll find pride in their color, in their skin tone, in their ethnicity, in their race. It's a natural result of what we're seeing today. So the root cause of this, and you have to address root causes here, not simply, oh, um, how do we look at this or that? No, we look at the root cause. Why is this taking place on either end? It's all ignorance. Yeah, and essentially, a Muslim being ignorant of their deen, the, the, the tradition that we have within this deen, they're ignorant of it, they're distant from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, therefore we have these two reactions. Mm -hmm. That's it. Otherwise, if we knew our deen, we would never go down this path, subhanAllah. And we would have front and center, da'uha fa innaha muntina. Now, I'd like to say that, you know, and people might, uh, I might take heed for this, but, you know, in our tradition, Islamically speaking, based on what we see from the Prophet ﷺ, a Muslim, technically speaking, is colorblind. What I mean by this, and don't get me wrong, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone, but overall, what I mean by this is that we're not going to judge you or look at you or basically prefer you based on a skin tone. Mm -hmm. Whether you are white, whether you are black, or any other skin, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. because and, here, and I just yeah. want to, Sheikh, because certain people, like non-Muslims, use that term colorblind yeah. to denote the fact that they don't see color. Yeah. Um, in an absolutist sense, but what we understand it from an Islamic perspective is that we're not colorblind in the sense where we don't acknowledge, hey, yeah. if I were to describe you and then say like a book of a biography I'm writing yeah. about, Sheikh Abdurrahman Murad, yeah. you know, I'd write, okay, this is his skin tone, this is his height, this is mm. how his beard looked or whatever. Yeah. So I, I write these descriptive, you know, things. So I'm not color, colorblind in, in the fact that I don't acknowledge yeah, true, that, you know, true. but you're we're colorblind in the sense that your value as a human being is not raised or lowered that's based true. on those physical attributes, correct? Yes, yes definitely. That's, that's what I mean by it. Yeah. That's what because said, this rhetoric yeah. is used by certain, oh, yeah, uh, of course. you know, people on both like the political left, like, yeah. and the right to prove, hey, I, I don't see color. I'm, I just yeah. base people, you know what I mean? But uh, we do see color, yeah. but we don't denote whether a person is yeah. more praiseworthy or less praiseworthy based, based yeah. upon so that. So basically, yeah. you know, this term, you can use it, but in a very structured way, as you've mentioned. Mm. You cannot just use it open-endedly because mm. it is being used today in an inappropriate way. Now, look, when I say whatever I said, I don't mean, like I said, any disrespect. But overall, we do acknowledge and recognize that oppression has taken place to people from different ethnicities and backgrounds. They've been put through so much, be they from, you know... Uh, Afro-Canadian descent, or you might have, for example, people from different backgrounds, uh, even native, uh, the native uh, natives that lived this land before the Caucasian man came here overall, you're going to have the same type of oppression that is discussed that we see today outlined. It doesn't mean I'm going to ignore that. No, I recognize it. Definitely took place. And how do you rectify this afterwards? That is different. And unlike, for example, looking at someone in light of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we're not to be taking sides based on, oh, he's this or that. That should not be the case. But now this being said, the reality is we have a lot of ignorance. We have Muslims who definitely would have that preferential approach to people based on skin tone. It's quite sad, subhanAllah. And the acid test over here, Sheikh, is that when you have someone claiming that they're, they don't see color, right, in that, uh, and they're using it in an obscure way, what they mean by that, we don't know. The acid test over here is that, well, would they allow, for example, their son or daughter to get married to someone from a different skin tone? You'll see at that point, with this issue coming up, that's when, subhanAllah, they might say, oh, I, no, I can't, mm -hmm. why? If it's something that's not based in deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that is inappropriate. But, um, I mean, that is the acid test that I look at. And uh, we should have that in the back of our minds, subhanAllah. Allah al okay. But going back to what you've mentioned now, the point of Umar radiallahu an being of a different skin tone, a black skin tone. Uh, like you said, it doesn't matter to us overall. But since it's been raised and spoken uh, of by uh, certain researchers, we can say, um, we have to look at the proof and evidence. What proof and evidence do we have to prove this point in specific? The reality is uh, the proof is taken from Shiite sources. Uh, those source books, they speak of this not in a positive tone. And this is the sad thing. And it shows you just how racist some people can be even from that time. Mm. They thought the way that we can demean Umar radiallahu an is by proving that he's from an African descent. To them, they prioritize, okay, a Persian... An Arab is first, then you have people from 
different ethnicities and tones last. So when they spoke about the color and the descent and background of Umar radiallahu an, they spoke of it from this perspective that he was from a different skin tone because he is less. That's Allah al -afiyah. So if you look at those source books, the Shiite source books are unlike Sunni source books where we have a chain of narration which we can use to prove the authenticity or weakness of a narration. They don't have that. Overall, you'll just find simply many men have said that many have said that many have said and this is the narration. So there's no way to prove who those people are. We don't know. But when you look at, compare that to what we have uh, within the Sunni tradition, you'll find that every single hadith is, you know, mentioned, regulated by individuals who we can go back to and affirm that each was trustworthy, that they actually heard from the person before them, and that they lived in the same period as well, and that they pass it on in the same condition to the person that took it from them afterwards. So it's a continuous chain of narration that we have within our tradition. And we don't have that for the skin tone or skin color of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh. We don't even find that there is any proof that he was from an African descent to begin with. Mm. So, you know, sadly, some might think that this is a positive thing. And like I said, it's nothing to do with the skin tone. But look at the reason why they actually said this about Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh. That where, that's where it becomes quite concerning, subhanAllah. Allah understand. SubhanAllah. So what you, let me get this straight because this is, I think, a, shows... Um, a new light or maybe puts a light on this issue in a way that uh, we may not have been aware of. So the Shia sources, the the, the proof for this yeah. that people uh, use are Shia sources. Yes. Uh, and uh, their motivation was actually to disparage yes. Umar bin al-Khattab yeah. because they looked at being a darker complexion as something that was less than yes. the Arab or the Persian. Yes. Whereas today, people might take that narration unknowingly, mm -hmm. saying, oh, we found a narration maybe to show, hey, uh, the relevance of yeah. black people in, in the time of uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they have a different motivation, but they're taking those narrations yeah. unbeknownst to them that uh, it's oh, yeah. actually... Uh, was planted as a means of disparaging Umar oh, yeah, bin Khattab. Of course, of course. I mean, if you look at the uh, the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were Sahaba who were from African descent, who were beloved, not just to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to all the companions. Mm. If you look at the story of Bilal Radiallahu Anh, where he was the Mu'addin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he would call the Adhan throughout that entire duration until Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had died. Thereafter, he couldn't get himself to call the Adhan. So the narrations, they speak of him having left Al Medina, and he came back after a certain period of time. The Sahaba were still living there, so he came and called the Adhan, the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Sahaba came out of the houses weeping because they recalled the beautiful times that they had with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The narrations speak of him thereafter saying that it was difficult for him, too difficult for him to go afterwards calling the Adhan, you know, after that point in time. Subhanallah. So. He was beloved to everyone, not because of skin tone, but because of his taqwa, his piety, and who he was to the Prophet wasallam. That was the point. You have others, subhanAllah, who likewise, you know, among the companions who came from diverse backgrounds. They weren't favored or distanced simply on account of the background. Look at Salman al-Farisi, radiallahu anh. Another companion, regardless of the complexion here now, he's not from an Arab background. We do have, you know, uh, within certain circles, that preferential approach to who you are based on the Arab tribe that you come from, right? Salman al-Faris radiallahu anh, he's a man of Jannah, as we know, among the great companions, the ulama of the companions, subhanAllah. We even have narrations where he had given advice to companions, and when this reached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah said, Sadaqa Salman. Mm -hmm. Salman has told the truth, and he has that knowledge, that ability to see what is best for a person, you know, subhanAllah. He had that fiqh, essentially. So, yeah, he wasn't preferred based on him being Persian, you had others, Suhaib al-Rumi, for example, who was from an Arab tribe, but overall they called him the Roman because he was, you know, captured, taken, brought it as a slave to Al-Medina. Long story short, likewise, he wasn't preferred or given that preferential approach based on him being from a different background. That was not part of the equation. It was how close you are to Allah, what you've put forth, what you've sacrificed. That was, you know, how the companions approached, you know, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nowadays, like I said, we cannot simply just take these stories and bring them back today. We have to first address the, the root problems that we have in society. And once we do address them, we can look at these examples. 
That, I think this is the biggest issue. We look back at the Sahaba's time. Oh, look at Bilal radiallahu an. We can do the same thing. We should be colorblind in this regard. But then we completely overlook the root causes of those problems that we have today in our society. Turn a blind eye, essentially. And we have what we have then, subhanAllah. Allah understand. The chaos, the problems that do arise, the conflict. You, you cannot work with unresolved issues. You have to resolve them first.